Ideology and Foreign Policy from Khomeini to Khomeini. Uh, Brandon is a research fellow at the Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University, um, a place that uh, Isa has done work on exchange programs with uh, Professor Bashri and others from the Center, so we're proud to continue the uh, connection. Uh, Brandon, uh, his PhD is focused on uh, regional politics of the Persian Gulf during the period of British withdrawal from the region. He did a master's uh, at the Department of Middle East and African History at Tel Aviv University, and he wrote on the roots of the 1920 Iraq Revolt. Uh, Brandon is from the U.S., now residing in Israel. Uh, previously, his before his academic work, he spent eight years in the field of intelligence and investigation in the United States, working on complex fraud and corruption matters, including searching for the hidden, for hidden international financial assets. Uh, over the last two years, he's also worked publishing short bulletins for the Center of Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University regarding the political, the current political developments and issues related to Iran. And of course, Iran has uh, important strategic, uh, geos, strategic and geopolitical uh, implications uh, these days, and certainly for the work of ISA, um, the regime, uh, the characters that Brandon will speak about are also not only speaking in terms of delegitimizing Israel and advocating for Israel's destruction, but I think at one level also spreading a narrative that is based on the protocols of the old vision side, really spreading a genocidal form of anti-Semitism, which is not just having traction at the political nuclear question at that level, but also at the grassroots that we're seeing the spread of it even as far away as places like East and West Africa, South America. So we need to understand the ideology of Brandon's work is really important to us. So it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, like Charles, I appreciate your flexibility. And I, I realize everyone has busy schedules, so thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Charles Small for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you at Yale. Um, and thanks to Lauren for all of her uh, administrative assistance, especially since there were a lot of last minute changes in I was traveling, so I appreciate Lauren's help as well. Um, can everyone hear me, first of all? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've sort of been losing my voice this week, unfortunately, so if my voice is cracking, I apologize. Uh, it's been a, a, a busy past few weeks for, uh, for me here, and I only get to the U.S. about once a year over the past four or five years. Um, I'd like to preface my talk today by mentioning uh, the fact that Quds Day, which is the Islamic Republic of Iran's annual day of de demonstrations, which are held in support of the Palestinian resistance to the state of Israel, fell on the Jewish New Year this year, uh, Friday, September 18th. Um, Quds Day is held annually at the end of the Ramadan holiday, um, and it falls at a different time each year because of the differences between the lunar calendar and the Gregorian calendar. Um, on Quds Day this year, uh, Iran's president, Ahmadinejad, um, Use the occasion to deliver uh, a pre-Friday prayer speech, uh, which was filled with Holocaust denial and conspiratorial language attacking Israel and Zionism. Um, Ahmadinejad's website quotes the president as saying, the pretext for establishing the Zionist regime is a lie. A lie which relies on an unreliable claim, a mythical claim, and the occupation of Palestine has nothing to do with the Holocaust. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, but in fact, the word a lie is, is, is a, a, a sort of a new development in Ahmadinejad's uh, inflammatory and bombastic statements. On, this, on, on the same day, on Al-Quds Day in Lebanon, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, also delivered a speech in which he said, from the first day and from the very beginning, the Imam Khomeini was very frank and said, Israel is a cancerous cell that must no longer exist. President Ahmadinejad is not bringing anything new. President Ahmadinejad is reviving the rhetoric of Imam Khomeini. May God have mercy on his soul. Israel must be annihilated. 
for anyone who's interested, I can provide you with the uh, BBC's English translations if you'd like to see the full statements. Um, as someone who's an aspiring historian and, and is training in the historical method, I often feel compelled to try to con contextualize these provocative and threatening statements. Um, and today I'm going to try to provide a framework for analysis of the Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, revolutionary ideology and foreign policy record. Um, before I get into the detail, I have four major points that I'd like to introduce today. First, I believe the Islamic Republic of Iran's foreign policy has been and continues to be revolutionary. Uh, but that does not mean pragmatic and ideological behavior are mutually exclusive. I plan to elaborate on that uh, as I get a little bit further on. The second point I have is that the broad themes of Iran's revolutionary identity are framed in its discourses of independence, justice, and resistance. And I'll elaborate on these a little bit further. Third, Iran's anti Israel anti Semitic ideology is couched in discourses of justice and resistance. However, these discourses fail to account for, anti, for the anti um, Semitic component of their revolutionary ideology, which has intensified since 2005 and included repeated instances of Holocaust denial. Uh, however, in addition to being an important revolutionary pillar, uh, Iran's anti Israel ideology has served an instrumental purpose in legitimating and provide, has served an instrumental, legitimating, and strategic function in Iran's uh, post-revolutionary domestic and regional politics. Uh, I'll also elaborate on this further. The fourth point that I, I'd like to uh, introduce today is, I do believe the regime has demonstrated in the past 30 years it is capable of compromising or tactically conceding on its, idea, uh, on its ideological um, goals. But these instances have occurred primarily when the regime's leadership has feared the survival of the regime is at stake. Um, and I plan on elaborating that a little bit further too. Uh, I'd like to begin with the issue I came here to discuss, which is the role of ideology in Iran's post-revolutionary foreign policy. Um, to begin with, I'd like to raise a question that I've often heard um, over and over again, uh, presented by Western statesmen and diplomats, as well as students in Europe, Israel, and here in the US. Um, the question is, does Iran act rationally or ideologically? Um, and there are many forms this question takes, and you hear it over and over again. Does Iran act on its interests, or does it act based on religious dogma? Is Iran pragmatic or fanatical? What role does religion play in Iran's foreign policy? Does Iran um, recognize the imperatives of real politique, or are they an ideological regime? I think what I'd like to do, I think my modest goal for today, is deconstruct that often raised question and try to tackle the underlying issues, and perhaps uh, raise the issue of whether that's the right question to be asking. Um, so what exactly do we mean when we talk about Iran's pragmatism? Are we talking about this? Are we all talking about the same thing? Uh, according to the Western uh, liberal canon of political philosophy, John Stuart Mill has described the flexibility behind the pragmatist's view of action as it can be experimental because it trusts the grand direction of the underlying pattern of change. I'll repeat that. It can be experimental because it trusts in the grand direction of the underlying pattern of change. In contrast to Western liberal thought, an Iranian scholar based in the Islamic Republic has characterized Islamic Shiite pragmatism of Iran as capable of being experimental because it trusts in the grand direction of its underlying pattern of values. Um, the point here is that the post-Khomeini leadership in Iran has derived its pragmatism from what it perceives as a dynamic ideology. And this definition of pragmatism is the conceptual opposite of the Western definition. In other words, Western statesmen and Iranian diplomats and elected officials may be using the same terms, but they're referring to completely different concepts. Scholars in the Islamic Republic argue that the conventional Western assumption of a pragmatic and fundamentalist dichotomy fails to account for pragmatic qualities and ethos of, the, of Islamic fundamentalism and what is considered pragmatic action occurring on the basis of submerged values. Um, 
That is to say, for Iran, pragmatic behavior can also be value-driven ideological behavior. Pragmatic and ideological behavior are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Ideological goals and material or strategic interests can be pursued in parallel, where one is mutually reinforcing the other, and it is not an either-or, zero-sum proposition. Uh, well, okay, you might be saying to yourself, but so what? Why does this distinction matter? Um, it matters because when West, Western statesmen perceive Iran's behavior as pragmatic, there may be a temptation to conclude that the Iranian re regime has reoriented itself and, no, and is no longer strictly adhering to its ideological principles. This conclusion is problematic because it pre presupposes an earlier phase of behavior which was not necessarily pragmatic and based entirely on ideological reasoning and does not differentiate between changes in means and changes in ends. As a result of this misconception, there is a tendency to mistake Iran's tactical concessions for regime reorientation, uh, and therefore conclude that the regime is moderating its objectives rather than applying different tactics or means to the same ideological goals. So for example, Rather than exporting its revolution via subversive military plots, which we saw actively during the first uh, seven to eight years of the Islamic Republic, it seems now that the Isra Islamic Republic has instead turned to soft power, the use of financial, religio, political, and cultural instruments to spread its ideological influence. The danger of confusing a change in means for a change in ends also has the potential to lead to a confusion regarding how the Islamic Republic of Iran perceives its interests. There may be some in the West who assume there is an inverse relationship between national interests and revolutionary Islamic values. In contrast, the regime in Iran conceives of religio-cultural norms and values as a constitutive component of its natural interests and not apart from them. Most Western observers of Iran tend to conceive of rationality, often used euphemist euphemistically with pragmatism, as behavior um, based on national interests defined in terms of material uh, interests, such as military, territorial, uh, territory, geographics, demographics, and economic strength. Or in other words, interests are, are um, defined in terms of material terms and distinct and superordinate to ideology meaning material interests are more important than ideological interests. This is a common conception um, in the West. In light of this view of interests, Western observers conventionally conceive of Iran's ideological behavior as irrational, fanatical, or as peripheral. Um, meanwhile, in contrast to the way of Westerners conceive of Iran's interests, the Islamic Republic believes in a religio-cultural component of natural interests, Almost a communicative interest that focuses on cultural authenticity and, nat and national pride. In other words, the strategic in interests of the Islamic Republic of Iran have their roots in the 1979 revolution and the revolution's political and cultural legacy. In short, I believe Iran has pursued a revolutionary foreign policy, perhaps with changing means, which has both served and defined its strategic goals. These goals, derived from Khomeini's ideology in the 1979 Constitution, have four central components. First, um, I would say the term social, social justice is often used in Iran, um, which I think uh, in the West tends to be confused with economic growth and development. So this is both an ideological and material interest for Iran. Second, preserving national sovereignty and territorial integrity is a primary interest of the Islamic Republic. This you can usually classify as a strategic issue, which is not um, different from how the West usually conceives um, national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Third, uh, one of Iran's primary strategic or um, ideological strategic goals is defending the rights of Muslims and supporting liberation movements, as they term them, um, or protecting the oppressed and confronting Israel and the US. I think we can all agree this is an ideological objective, which at times has instrumental, serves instrumental purposes. Fourth, the establishment of an Islamic, fourth, the establishment of an Islamic polity based on Shi'i principles, which I think is also an ideological objective. 
So we see in these four objectives a unique co coexistent, coexistence and tension between ideological and material and strategic interests in the world. Uh, so I think in order to better contextualize President Ahmadinejad's antagonistic and offensive statements towards Israel and about the Holocaust, I think it's important to introduce um, three of the primary or three of the primary themes behind Iran's revolutionary ideology. I've talked at this point a lot about ideology, but I haven't really explained what exactly it is. Um, I think Iran's foreign policy discourse and behavior were revolutionary during the first decade of the Islamic Revolution, of, of the Islamic Republic, a period during which it was fighting a long and bloody war with Iraq and struggling to consolidate its con control over its own state institutions. In the late 1980s, following the death of Khomeini, the executive branch of the Iranian government was strengthened by constitutional reforms, and President Rafsanjani attempted to soften Iran's approach to the international community. Uh, this effort, while limited in scope, reached its peak in the late 1990s under former President Khatami, uh, who served as president between 97 and 2005. Both Rafsanjani and Khatami focused much of their efforts on trying to improve Iran's relations with the community of states through confidence-building statements, improved relationship building with international organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank, and presenting the Islamic Republic as a rule-abiding actor in the international system. These efforts, however, were offset by Iran's steadfast opposition to any progress in the Palestinian-Israeli peace process in the 1990s, its active support for militant organizations such as Hezbollah, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other groups during and after the 1990, 1993 Oslo Peace Accords, um, as well as pursuing its undeclared nuclear development program throughout the 90s. In, 19, in the 1990s, there was a gap between um, the Iranian president's policy statements and its subversive actions, which made analyzing Iran's foreign policy very difficult. In contrast, in the 1990s, one of the central themes of Iran's third revolution, as the Ahmadinejad period has come to be known, has been its relentless rhetorical attacks on the international system. Um, Henry Kissinger, in, in, in his first book, A World Restored, observed that whenever there exists a power which considers the international order or manner of legitimizing it oppressive, uh, or manner of legitimizing and oppressive relations between that power and the others will be re revolutionary. In these cases, Kissinger noted, it is not the adjustment of differences within the given system which will be at issue, but the system itself. Uh, Iran's current foreign minister, Motaki, authored uh, an article which was published in the uh, Iranian Journal of International Affairs in the spring of 2007. Um, it was entitled, What is a Just Global Order?, in which he stated that the order in the context of the international system is discriminative and hence not functional anymore. Motaki continued and said, also the order in international society is a combination of imposed concepts which define structure of the same international system based on power without principle and justice. Later in the same article, Motaki claims that a multicultural global order controlled by one pole in which the relation between this pole and the world remain, remains ethnocentric is not acceptable. Uh, I'll repeat that. A multicultural global order controlled by one pole is not acceptable. Iranian, the Iranian leadership's opposition to the current international system is rooted in Iran's revolutionary discourse, which has three main elements, resistance, justice, and independence. Iran's emphasis on independence is often interpreted in the West as Iranian nationalism because this emphasis on independence has been a consistent element of Iran's regime identity throughout the 20th century and even beyond. Iran's emphasis on independence stems from three things. Its association with a glorious uh, ancient past, uh, most recently as a Muslim Safavid power uh, in between the 16th and 18th centuries, its historical victimization by, pre, by its pre-modern foreign invader, invaders, the Greeks, the Turks, and the Mongols, and its complicated encounters with the imperial powers, Russia in the 19th century, Britain in the US, um, Britain primarily in, a, in the US in the 20th century, 
which it sees as responsible for its dependence and underdevelopment. I think that's an important thing to remember. For example, President Ahmadinejad and his su supporters have compared um, the previous Hatami administration's decision to suspend nuclear, in, nuclear uranium enrichment in November 2004 as worse than Iran's treaty, treaty with Russia at Turkmenchai in 1828. Specifically, he used the comparison. This, tre this treaty had forced the Iranian Qajar dynasty to cede huge portions of Iranian territory to Russia. The territory was never regained and today forms portions of present-day present day Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Um, Iran's emphasis on independence is different from the Western understanding of nationalism in international politics. It has caused one scholar based in the Islamic Republic to classify it as maximalist or hyper-independence. Another um, Iranian scholar based in the U.S. has referred to it as true independence. Um, this hyper-independence has manifested itself in two ways. First, it causes Iran to resist what it perceives as foreign dominance in the international system. And two, it causes Iran to place an unusual emphasis on self-reliance in the security realm, uh, which is a very important point. Moreover, these are principles that are, are enshrined in its constitution from 1979. There are Articles 2, 3, and 153, if you would like to check, which reject, reject explicitly any form of dependence or submission to foreign states. For example, uh, for an example of this hyper-independence, during President Ahmadinejad's speech to the UN General Assembly in New York in 2005, the language he used was, uh, was he attacked those hegemonic powers who consider the scientific and technological progress of an independent and free nations as a challenge to their monopoly on these instruments of power and who do not want to see those such achievements in other countries. Ahmadinejad uses this language because he perceives himself as the defending uh, Iranian independence from foreign domination. Uh, I most of my references here are to, uh, my, and my sources are based on Iranian scholars. I would, however, like to get back to Henry Kissinger for just one second. Kissinger noted that the motivation of a revolutionary power may well be defensive, as Iran's motivation historically has appeared to be. And it may well be sincere in its pro protestations of feeling threatened. And I, as I have no doubt, Iran uh, certainly feels threatened. However, the key distinguishing feature of a revolutionary power, as Kissinger pointed out, is not that it feels threatened. Such feelings are inherent um, in the nature of international relations based on sovereign states. But that nothing can reassure it. Only absolute security, the neutralization of the opponent, is considered a sufficient security guarantee. And thus the desire, for one power, the desire of one power for absolute security means absolute insecurity for all others. Uh, R.K. Ramazani, a leading U.S.-based scholar of Iranian foreign policy, observed that um, in the 1980s that the policy statements of Iranian leaders almost never used the word security by itself. They always preceded the word security with adjectives such as real, true, or genuine security. Um, a, a prominent scholar based in the Islamic Republic, noting the rigid criteria that the regime had set out for true independence, uh, argued that a balance needs to be struck between preserving political sovereignty, not independence, he specifically says, and a stable and permanent cooperation with the West. The scholar also argued there is no such concept as political independence, and urged the Iranian elites to move from anti, the anti-colonial tendencies of the 1950s to the realities of statecraft in the 21st century. Um, so the first principle of the revolutionary discourse is independence. The second principle element of the revolutionary discourse is the demand for justice. Uh, in Shia Islam, justice is considered one of the pillars of faith. I think one of the central themes of Ayatollah Khomeini's revolutionary ideology was the triumph of the oppressed in the face of injustice. Um, this is sort of a populist sentiment which calls for the powerless or disadvantaged masses of people to escape from the oppression of sort of the world superpowers. Khomeini sort of grouped the, the capitalists, the socialists, the Zionists, the fascists, and the communists into this group of oppressors. 
Khomeini assisted, insisted that the dispossessed must triumph over the dominant elements. Uh, in Khomeini's view, justice is viewed as a universal value and responsibility, and this principle is articulated in Article 154 of the Constitution, which says that the Islamic Republic of Iran considers the rule of justice to be the right of all people of the world. Uh, it is through the principle of justice that Ahmadinejad and his supporters have relentlessly attacked the Holocaust and attempted to delegitimize Israel, support the Palestinians and other liberation movements, and criticize the US-led international system for mobilizing support for Israel. Now, I'm sure there are people who are more familiar um, with hate um, speech and anti-Semitic uh, ideology than I am here. Um, however, I think Ahmadinejad, Iran's attempt to couch Ahmadinejad's statements in this principle of justice um, is falls short of the mark. Um, on December 9th in 2005, um, Ahmadinejad was in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Mecca is the seat and symbol of Islam, and said some European countries insist on saying that the World War II, that during World War II, Hitler burned millions of Jews. And they insist so strongly on this issue that anyone who denies it is condemned and sent to prison. He continued, saying, although we don't believe this claim, let's suppose that what the Europeans say is true. Let's give some land to the Zionists in Europe or Germany or Austria. We will support it. They faced injustice in Europe, so why do the Palestinians have to pay the consequences? The clause, although we don't believe this claim, is outright Holocaust denial and cannot or nor should not be viewed as instrumental geostrategic uh, politics, despite the Islamic Republic's argument that it is supporting justice for the Palestinians. Years before Ahmadinejad became president of the Islamic Republic, the supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei also attacked Israel by attempting to cast doubt on the atrocities of the Holocaust. In April 2001, uh, he said, there is proof that the Zionists have close relations with German Nazis. The presentation of astronomical figures on the massacre of the Jews was in itself a means, a means of making people express sympathy with them and prepare the ground for occupying Palestine and justifying the Zionist crimes. The political leadership in Iran have used Holocaust denial as one element of a broader, vehement anti-Zionist position, which reflects traditional anti-Jewish themes in Iran's national and religious culture. My colleague, Mayor Litvak, in Tel Aviv, has astutely noticed, noted that, as opposed to modern scholarly literature on nationalism, these traditions do not view the Jews as a nation, but as a rather scattered religious community who rejected the message of the Prophet Muhammad. These traditions are an important part of the teaching of Ayatollah Khomeini, the ideological founder and leader of the Islamic Republic, and have guided the, the government since 1979. Um, on the, I just want to point out, on the first page of um, Khomeini's uh, book, Islamic, Gov uh, Islamic Government, uh, Hukuma al-Islamiya, um, you will find him inveighing against the Jews in the first or second paragraph, even before he defines what his notion of the Islamic government is. Um, he wrote with a distinct anti-Jewish theme, which combined Shi ideology with elements of European anti-Semitism, according to my colleague, Peter Litva. Um, he has written, since its inception, the Islamic movement has been afflicted with the Jews, who have established anti-Islamic propaganda and joined in various stratagems, and as you can see, this activity continues down to our present day. In Khomeini's earlier book, The Clarification of the Questions, uh, which is usually the book that elevates you to the rank of Ayatollah, uh, he emphasized the Shi'i doctrine of the ritual impurity of unbelievers whom he considered contaminated. He directed his followers not to purchase products which could not be purified, such as food at the market, from unbelieving infidels. Khomeini's successor to the supreme leadership, Ayatollah Khamenei, and other current and former officials in Iran during the past 30 years have remained committed to this particular pillar of the Khomeini doctrine. It would seem that President Ahmadinejad, the supreme leader in the spirit of Khomeini's ideology, believe that a just solution for the Palestinians is the elimination of the Jewish state of Israel. This stems from the view of hardline officials in the Islamic Republic who believe that Zionism is part of a Western imperialist designs against Islam 
which are then supported by the unjust international system. Um, how are we doing for time? All right. Um, I think on October 25th in Tehran, Ahmadine, uh, October 26th, sorry, 2005 in Tehran, Ahmadinejad gave a speech at a, a small student conference in which, for the first time, he called for the elimination of Israel. Literally, this Jerusalem occupying regime must vanish from, vanish from the pages of time. The, the semantics and language of this statement has um, received a lot of attention and gone back and forth as people have attempted to explain away exactly what Ahmadinejad has said. Uh, I'm not going to get into the linguistics of it. There are experts uh, who can speak to that far more intelligently than I can. I, I would just refer you to a quote from uh, Hossein Chariat Madari, the editor of the Iranian daily newspaper, Kehan, and the close advisor to the Supreme Leader of Iran, who said, um, the Honorable President, meaning Ahmadinejad, has said nothing new about Israel that would justify all of this political commotion. We declare explicitly that we will not be satisfied with anything less than the complete obliteration of the Zionist regime from the political map of the world. Uh, that statement appeared in Kehan on 30 October 2005. And I can also refer you to um, where it was cited in English, uh, if you'd like a translation. In January 2001, um, the Supreme Leader said Israel was a cancerous tumor that needed to be removed from the region. In December 2001, now this is four years prior to Ahmadinejad, former President Rafsanjani, while leading a Friday prayer service in Tehran, threatened Israel with nuclear destruction and said, if one day the Islamic world is also equipped with we weapons like those Israel possesses now, then the imperialist strategy will reach a standstill because the use of even one nuclear bomb inside of Israel will destroy everything. It is not, ira it is not irrational, note, note the use, it is not irrational to contemplate such an eventuality. Um, Iranian officials have used the principles of their principles of justice and equality to attack the hierarchy of powers in the international system. Um, Ahmadinejad has referred to uh, the attempt of Western nuclear powers to prevent Iran from enriching uranium as nuclear apartheid, and said to the Turkish Prime Minister, with respect to the needs of Islamic countries, we are ready to transfer nuclear know-how to these countries. He was attacking what he perceives to be injustice and inequality in the double standards of the international system. Uh, Iran argues that uh, the U.S. posture towards the nuclear program of Iran is unjust and a double standard um, in comparison to the U.S. posture towards <coughs> India, Israel, Pakistan, and other U.S. allies. Um, so the two themes of the revolutionary discourse so far, we have independence and justice. Resistance is the third key element of the Islamic Republic's revolutionary ideology and it has received an increased emphasis since 2005. The idea of resistance is and has been a powerful theme um, in Iran's revolutionary discourse since 1979. It also goes beyond that. Iran has lionized the historic, its historical episodes that focus on political resistance to preserve its independence. There was the tobacco movement in, 18, in, in the early 1890s, the constitutional revolution, in between 1905 and 1911, the oil nationalization movement during the Mossadegh years in the 50s, and um, Khomeini's initial Islamic resistance to uh, capitulations to the U.S. in 1963. On the other hand, while these uh, episodes of resistance have received a lot of attention, anyone who compromises in any form in exchange for any reward in terms of Iran's independence has been castigated severely in Iran, um, and most often lost their position. Uh, so to return to my opening point, um, now that we've sort of, I've sort of briefly sketched out what I feel to be the broad themes of Iran's revolutionary discourse, um, I'd like to raise the issue that rather than asking ourselves, and, and when I say us, I'm talking about um, uh, sort of track two diplomatic meetings in which I've sat in on in which Western statesmen raise this question of whether Iran is an ideological actor or a rational or pragmatic actor, I think the question we should be asking us is, 
Under what circumstance and or in what context has the Islamic Republic of Iran demonstrated it is likely to compromise or tactically concede on its principles? So rather, is he, rather, the, rather than asking the question, is Iran either ideological or rational, pragmatic, however you'd like to phrase it, we should ask ourselves when they're likely to behave in sort of the Western notion of rational pragmatism and compromise or tactically concede, but not reorient its, against its principles. I believe that the answer to that question is demonstrated by the historical record of the past 30 years. Um, one of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's most oft-repeated phrases late in, late in his life and, um, was, the preservation of the Islamic Republic is a divine duty which is above all other duties. What he was saying is, the preservation of the Islamic Republic supersedes everything else in their ideology. Now, that's a very vague <coughs> and, and, and general outline, but I think the way it's been interpreted based on what I've seen is Iran has compromised on its ideological principles when it feels that the when the Islamic Republic's um, regime is at risk. Uh, let me repeat that. It, it is compromised or tactically conceded when it believes the regime is at risk. I think the best examples of that were its acceptance of the UN resolution, uh, um, Security Council Resolution 598, which ended the Iran-Iraq war, which for all intents and purposes, Iran had lost. Uh, and had said that they would never um, concede defeat. That is held up as sort of the beginning of sort of a, a pragmatic phase of uh, the Republic's behavior, which um, I argue against. Um, the second, uh, I, I think the second instance um, would be Iran's acceptance of the additional protocol from the IE, IAEA in 2003, and then the, um, um, and then agreeing to cease its uranium, uranium enrichment in 2004. I think the timing, the 2003-2004 time period is critical. The U.S. had, uh, in 2001, invaded Afghanistan and removed the regime there. In 2000, March of 2003, it invaded Iraq and removed the regime there. And it wasn't until 2005 that it, it started to become clear that the U.S. would have severe difficulties in both those theaters. Meaning that in the 2003 to 2005 period, I think Iran felt very much at risk. The Islamic Republic's leadership felt threatened on, on all sides. Uh, and I think, as a result, they made tactical concessions on the nuclear program. Um, the other period that's often raised as a pragmatic period in, in Iran's history is the 89 to 1993 time period, which was uh, President Rafsanjani's first term of president. It was during this period, though, if, if we if we look closely at Iran's history, that it was suffering a severe economic crisis, um, which eventually led to a, uh, a severe drop in the price of oil, which is Iran's sole source of revenue. I think when we saw um, the Islamic Republic's approach to the IMF and the World Bank and its attempt to soften its um, image uh, with many ins international institutions, I think this was primarily a way to attempt to get itself on firmer economic footing. I felt the. I think that there is firm evidence to show that the regime felt threatened by its current state of its economy. Um, and a, a great example of this would be the renewal of relations with Saudi Arabia, an important OPEC partner. And by the way, um, it was in Ayatollah Khomeini's last will and testament to never resume relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, so it's a pretty significant reversal um, of, a, a, of one of Khomeini's doctr doctrinal statements. Um, the last, the last uh, issue that is often waved around as um, a, a, an example of Iran's um, pragmatic behavior is, that, is the Iran-Contra affair um, in the mid-80s. Um, I think this, this is a poor example of, of Iran behaving pragmatically. I think it's a fine example of the fact that the, the war with, uh, against Iraq was at a very precarious stage at that point, and Iran was looking for help wherever they could get it. And again, an example of they would do anything to, to protect the survival of the state. Um, I, I want to conclude with, um, with, with Kissinger again, uh, and, and sort of a comment he made on diplomacy. Uh, 
Kissinger said, it's a mistake to assume that diplomacy can always settle international disputes if there is good faith and willingness to come to an agreement. For in a revolutionary international order, each power will seem to its opponent to lack precisely those qualities. Diplomats can still meet, but they cannot persuade, for they have ceased to speak the same language. In the absence of an agreement on what constitutes a reasonable demand, diplomatic conferences are occupied with sterile repetitions of basic positions and accusations of bad faith, or allegations of unreasonableness and subversion. They become elaborate stage plays. Now, um, I think that's an important um, uh, issue to bear in mind. I think the diplomacy, I think the world is always compelled to engage in diplomacy, but I think the world is also compelled to evaluate diplomacy at each stage to make sure it's advancing towards a concrete goal and not just talking for the sake of talking. Um, with that, I'll end. If you'd like, I'm happy to talk about the policy implications of what I've talked about, sort of the theoretical things I've talked about today. Um, I welcome disagreements and questions. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Paper. Paper. So thank you very much. Uh, so we did uh, talk about uh, the conditions that uh, might uh, be the readiness to play board. Um, but you know, it might be also interesting to look at uh, what might be the conditions for the readiness to push with their own agenda, ignore anything else. Uh, any comments about uh, what might be such conditions? Because we, meaning, we, meaning we, how far we push them to just do it, whatever it is they want to do? No, I would say what kind of an atmosphere, political atmosphere, international atmosphere, uh, will be a, a setup for the Iranians to actually uh, push their uh, agenda. Uh, I mean, I can I think of one uh, uh, incident that happened uh, quite lately when uh, they had elections. Unfortunately, President Obama uh, was not decisive enough, and wasn't clear enough, and wasn't uh, behind uh, the opposition. And uh, I think, uh, in, my, in, in my view, and I'm not an expert on this issue, uh, in my view, I think uh, it was a transmission of a message uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you can go ahead and uh, we are not going to get involved. And I think this is the day that you started to see, you know, how they went out of the streets and started killing uh, those protesters. <coughs> so I, I just wonder, from your knowledge, do you see more examples that are falling on that path? Uh, I'll tell you, this is my personal opinion, um, that I think Obama was in a difficult position. Um, I think ultimately he did the right thing not interfering more forcefully at an earlier stage. I think the U.S. has a very long and troubled history of interfering in Iranian domestic politics, <clears throat> and it's precisely for that purpose that there is um, mutual and a long history of mutual antagonism between um, certain elements uh, in, in Iran uh, and the U.S. So, so just to, to ask about it. So you think that if, uh, let's say, Obama was more decisive on uh, what uh, the world saw on the TV, uh, you think that uh, the result might be even worse than uh, what happened? Yeah, I think potentially. Good. Um, now, uh, I, I think that, I, think that um, I mean, it's hard to say hypothetical. As, as a historian, I tend, to, I, I tend to shy away from talking about what ifs because it's happened, it's hard to say. But um, I think, uh, let me be clear about um, the nuclear issue. I think Iran is unlikely to make a deal that compromises its nuclear independence, meaning forego enrichment, um, unless uh, it feels that there is an imminent threat of regime removal. And let, let me also be clear that I don't think an Israeli strike falls into that category of regime. I don't think Iran perceives Israeli strikes as a threat to regime removal. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that they don't feel threatened by them and they're not, they don't want them and they're not scared of them. I believe all of the above is true. 
but I don't think they view Israeli strikes in the same category they view a potential U.S. regime removal um, in terms of uh, changing their behavior. Um, it's an unpopular thing to say, but I think that's the truth. Uh, and again, it's just my opinion. So, so the follow-up on the last question. So, even you know, during uh, Kissinger, you keep quoting Kissinger a few times. So Kissinger, when he engaged China and during the Entente, right. the Nixon administration was engaging. Yet they were very critical of human rights violations and the, the problems and contradictions in Chinese society. Today, there seems to be, to me, uh, as a relative outsider, that the Obama administration and Europe until now, maybe there's a shift in Europe, I think, to France possibly, that there isn't this critique of a human rights violation within Iran, not a forceful one in my opinion. And when it comes to the export of the revolution and terror, and supporting and the genocidal anti-Semitism and the other really aggressive human rights violations that are taking place within the country. The West seems to be capitulating. So my question to you as a historian, you know, if, as a historian, what is happening? Because for 30 years, either by design or by horrible mistakes, the American governments and uh, administrations and the West has essentially propped up the regime. My, historically speaking, the regime continues to grow and get stronger. And everything, almost everything, different administrations have done, from Reagan running away from Lebanon to this situation now with Obama, the administration seems to be empowering the regime. So as a historian, what's going on? Okay, there, there are three things I'm going to say in response to that. But first, I, I also want to make something clear based on this question. I also believe that sanctions, um, there is a potential um, set of sanctions that could make the regime feel like its survival is at stake. However, the, that set of sanctions require full cooperation from Russia, China, as well as India, and, Swiss, and as well as the Swiss and the Germans as well. Um, I don't think that's very likely um, for a variety of different reasons it would take me too long to explain. But I also want to put that on the table because I think that is a, a potential avenue to explore if, if there is a way to get it done, which I think is unlikely. I'm glad you brought up the China comparison. Um, uh, there was a big article in Foreign Affairs uh, recently that also raised this issue that perhaps Obama should go to uh, Tehran the way Nixon went to China. It ignores two things, I think. Um, first, the geostrategic environment during that period in which there was a rapprochement between Nixon and, um, and Mao was essentially China felt threatened by Russia. Um, there had been um, ongoing conflict between the two. Russia was a very proximate and imminent threat to China. And China, China felt that perhaps um, alleviating its confrontation with the US would um, provide it with more room with respect to Russia. So it had a very clear, what I would consider, um, what international relations people call positional um, incentive to change its behavior regarding the, the US. Um, I'm not sure that incentive exists right now or that the Iranian regime uh, perceives that um, in the same way. Right, and, and, and you know, I think that uh, I think there is there are certain elements. I, I don't want to portray the um, Iranian domestic domestic political landscape as monolithic. There are many um, groups and factions within Iran, I think, who are pushing and would like to see what they describe as normalization with the U.S. And I think that's primarily for that's for a variety of reasons. But I think that. Um, the group that seems to have uh, uh, brought itself or consolidated power following the latest round of elections does not want to see that. Um, and so it's unclear whether, you know, that it takes sort of two to tango. Um, and so if the U.S. wants to normal, even if Obama wanted to go to China, or wanted, if Obama wanted to go to Tehran the way Nixon went to China, there would have to be someone waiting in Tehran to shake his hand. Presumably, someone with real power. 
And it's not entirely clear whether that person or group of people exists right now. Um, there, there may be a group or, or, or person who exists, but they don't really have real material power, and so they can't really change the course of um, policy between the two states. Um, so I think that these comparisons are not really rooted in, in good historical understanding of what went into Nixon's rapprochement with China in, in the 70s. And I think we need to revisit that case before we make the historical comparison. Otherwise, we're just sort of talking in, in metaphors that really have no meaning. Did that answer your question? I, oh, I, the, 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 the point about propping up the regime. I, I think I would disagree with that. Um, I think that this regime, as I said, has emphasized self-reliance and has sort of thrived to the extent that it can on being isolated by the West. If we look at the 90s, the US pretty much pursued a policy of dual containment um, against both Iraq and Iran, um, doing its best to isolate, doing what it could, it could to isolate the regime um, without removing it in a <coughs> physical way, but certainly not helping it in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's propped it up so much as uh, we have to give, we should give the regime, the regimes in Iran over the last 30 years some credit for um, sort of finding their way around the hurdles that the both the U.S. and the international community, etc. Uh, and things like looking east to China and, and, and have been creative ways to work around um, various economic penalties that the, U the U.S. and Western Europe has sought to impose on them. Um, so, and I think in the most recent rounds of talk, there was a bit of emphasis on human rights. Um, in, in the most recent meetings that took place, at which William Burns uh, uh, sat down with Iranian officials, I think there was talk of human rights during that meeting. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, 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 yeah, there's also talk of selling uranium. All right. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think the reason that you know so many people are interested in whether Iran is a pragmatic or ideological you know actor depends on you know whether or not we think that traditional deterrence or things like that would work if they actually get a nuclear bomb. So my question is, you said that anti-Zionism is deeply embedded in the whole revolutionary ideology, and that in the Ayatollah Khomeini's thing, the second paragraph you said. I think it masks the even deeper anti-Semitism, but yeah. Right, so my question is, if that's really embedded in the ideology, yet you also said that like the ultimate goal is to preserve the regime, wouldn't like the actual nuclear bombing or, you know, destruction of the Zionist state, you know, the state of Israel, wouldn't that sort of defeat the whole Iranian regime's race on death row? Like, it, wouldn't it, doesn't that sort of, even if, even if you're not thinking of deterrence terms, even if we're thinking just in self-preservation terms, right. you know, and I know, obviously, nuclear bombing is something you want to mess around. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'll answer the question the best I can. I'm not a deterrence expert, but I have been, I have had the opportunity to listen in on conversations between people who are experts in deterrence. And it is a very, um, it is a, a, a theoretically rich field um, with a rich body of literature about it. And there is a, a big debate about whether um, deterrence between Israel and Iran can work. Um, and you know, I, I'm not going to weigh in on that because I just, I, I'm not educated enough to do it. What I will say is that, like I said, I don't, I don't feel that um, Iran perceives an, an Israeli attack on its nuclear sites to be a, um, a threat to its regime. I, I think it's certainly aware that Israel may possess a nuclear capability. So, um, but um, what I'm saying though isn't, but are, do you think that the regime is? aware that sort of, you know, the fact that Israel does exist and that it can criticize Israel is sort of a means for them to preserve self-preservation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, if you're saying that, I believe, does that, does that play into their, their, their logic of justi justification? Right. Like, Ab absolutely. And you'll, and, and you'll hear it, you'll hear it mentioned all the time. I think, you know, to be honest, I, I think one of Iran's strategic objectives is to is to achieve strategic parity with Israel in the region. Um, and so I think that informs what they're doing. Um, 
Yes, I'm, I can see that. Just as a point, as a scholar, or a student of anti Semitism, I think we see historically more and more, you know, often once this sort of virus of anti Semitism is unleashed, the rationality of regimes sort of goes out the window. You have actually regimes that will risk their own continuation. Right. Well, I guess the question, the question becomes, what, what is their uh, use of their, is, which is more significant, as, like, their anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, or the, like, what the existence of Israel does to benefit their own self-preservation? I, 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 I think the system. question is more complicated. I, I mean, I, 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 see your, I see your basic question, which is an important one, but I think the more complicated question that you have to ask yourself is, you know, what creates the circumstances where a confrontation like that would emerge? And it's really hard to predict. Uh, I mean, I think I think the, there was a great cover story on, on this week's Newsweek magazine. I think it was written by Fareed Zakaria, who, who tries to address the whole nuclear issue. And I like I thought the article was tremendously well written, but towards the end he he says he sort of says unequivocally he assumes that Iran will be deterred by Israel. And I can tell you as someone who lives in Israel that Israel is not confident or comfortable with that assumption. And so Zachariah writing that it will happen, you know, based in the US, you know, if that's his opinion, that's his opinion. But I'm telling you, as someone who, who lives there, that, uh, that is the very issue that people in Israel are not comfortable with. Because um, deterrence is, it, you know, it's not a science. Uh, um, any other questions? I have a, a, uh, I guess a theoretical question in terms of um, the use of the term ideology in particular, um, which uh, in reference to international relations theory type people, you know, um, ideology um, as opposed to identity, right? Um, where you have this kind of debate between realists and constructivists about ideology versus identity. And when you talked about um, this ideology as constitutive of you know, in Iranian outlook, it's not necessarily um, ideology versus interests. That's very similar to language that would talk about identity rather than ideology. So, um, you know, what are the reasons to keep the term ideology um, rather than to um, choose to reflect something you know, on something like identity? You, you, you raise a great issue, um, which um, which is a, it's, it's a very theoretical. Uh, question. So for those, those of you who aren't familiar with the, the vast body of IR theory, uh, this might seem kind of like weird stuff. Um, I, I will tell you that the, um, there is a very rich uh, field of literature from uh, IR people in the public. And when they talk about this issue, they talk about identity. And it, because there is a very, uh, and they talk about constructivism. Even, I mean, I was shocked to read the foreign minister talking about constructivism. I mean, he was, I mean, the foreign minister in this essay he wrote in the Iranian Journal of International Affairs was calling for an epistemological shift in the way the world thinks about things. I can't remember ever seeing a foreign minister of any state talking about epistemology uh, in something they've written while they were a minister, um, which I thought was interesting. I guess what I was trying to say is I'm not re ready to concede. First of all, as a historian, I, I, I don't want to tie myself up in this, you know, this rigid debate, um, which which seems to be, you know, fairly polarized between realists and constructivists and and neo-realists, and, and I recognize the differences, um, but I think I would tend to say that um, that there is a parallel that you can draw between ideology. And I think if you read these Iranian scholars closely, you'll see that. Yeah. I agree. The reason why I'm asking is because ideology has and, you know, a tendency to be viewed as something that's heavily used for instrumental purposes. Right, which right. I was trying to address. Which it seems like you're trying to say is not the only case right. where ideology is being used. And so there seems to be a bit of a tension in your argument. Um, right, realistic. At one point in time, I'm trying to argue that it's not just ideology used to rationalize 
some other purpose. There is something that's deeper underlying. And today, at times, might get trumped, but that is actually, you know, a has a causal you know, right. influence on things. It seems like there's a bit of a tension. Right. I think in that respect, I, I definitely probably come closer in agreeing with the construction constructivists in the sense that I believe that, that they're. I, I don't see it as the neo-realists or the neo-realists don't even see see it as mattering, but the, as the classical realists would see it as as an, a strictly instrumental thing, meaning, um, you know, ideology is used for, for a, a only geopolitical purposes. I believe that Ahmadinejad uses um, his statements against Israel and his Holocaust denial both ideologically and instrumentally. And I think it's hard to um, sort of pull them apart. Uh, and the way, the way um, political scientists, and especially, and IR people will, will try to do. I think it's a bit artificial, and, and I think um, when you read what Iranian, Iranian states people and um, scholars are writing, they also don't like it. Um, but I, I think that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about different world views. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> the recent um, protests after the election, um, what exactly, apart from more transparency, did they want? What, what do the, the protesters want? And are they, have they had any significance at all? I think what they want is political. Uh, you know, it's great because I was talking about justice, and the regime always talks about social justice, and primarily what they're talking about is um, you know, the poor and the rich, the haves and the have-nots. However, what gets lost in their, in some of their uh, discourse is political justice, political freedom, uh, a more open civil society. I think one of the more fascinating things that we saw in the protest was the role of women, specifically, not just um, leading, leading the fight online, but leading the fight on the streets in the middle of the violence, urging people on and getting beaten themselves. I think, I can't remember ever seeing that in the Middle East, and I can't remember seeing it uh, anywhere recently. Um, and I think part of the reason we see that is because um, there are apparently a lot of women in Iran who feel they are second-class citizens in some respects and, and would like change in terms of political liberties. Um, I think what, so what we're seeing, in my opinion, in part, obviously it's more complicated than it just this, is a fight for political justice, for political freedom within the Islamic system. I don't think we're seeing people protesting on the street so that they can have Western-style democracy. I think they want their system to open up. Um, and what's interesting, I think, to, to watch is that, to a certain degree, Iran, is always, Iran has been one of the most educated states in the Middle East and the most open in terms of the internet. And um, as opposed to China, which has always regulated its internet since the internet sort of exploded, Iran didn't really regulate its internet quite as tightly. So. Can you put the genie back in the box once it's been out um, with respect to how the internet influences civil society? I, it'll, that issue to me is an interesting one to watch going forward. Um, do, the, do they really have a fighting chance? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Could they affect? Uh, I, I think they can. I think we're seeing change right now. I think the issues are you know, how, in what shape, at what pace. How it's likely to do a so. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to wrap up because there's another class coming. Okay, Brandon, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And just a quick announcement next Friday at 4 15, Harry Rubin will be here. He's speaking about a whole tour of anti Semitism in Poland to the talk on PLO. Flexibility. I, I realize everyone has busy schedules, so thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Charles Small for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you at Yale. Um, and thanks to Lauren for all of her uh, administrative assistance, especially since there were a lot of last minute changes and I was traveling. So I, I appreciate Lauren's help as well. Um, can everyone hear me, first of all? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've sort of been losing my voice this week, unfortunately, so if my voice is cracking, I apologize. Uh, 
it's been a, a busy past few weeks for, uh, for me here. I only get to the U.S. about once a year over the past four or five years. Um, I'd like to preface my talk today by mentioning uh, the fact that Quds Day, which is the Islamic Republic of Iran's annual day of de demonstrations, which are held in support of the Palestinian resistance to the State of Israel, fell on the Jewish New Year this year, uh, Friday, September 18th. Um, Quds Day is held annually at the end of the Ramadan holiday, um, and it falls at a different time each year because of the differences between the lunar calendar and the Gregorian calendar. Um, on Quds Day this year, uh, Iran's president, Ahmadinejad, um, used the occasion to deliver uh, a pre-Friday prayer speech, uh, which was filled with Holocaust denial and conspiratorial language attacking Israel and Zionism. Um, Ahmadinejad's website quotes the president as saying, the pretext for establishing the Zionist regime is a lie. A lie which relies on an unreliable claim, a mythical claim, and the occupation of Palestine has nothing to do with the Holocaust. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, but in fact, the word a lie is, is a, a, a sort of a new development in Ahmadinejad's time. Uh, Thank you for being uh, not only coming here, but uh, being flexible to really time up. Uh, we want to be with uh, Sister Divinik, who's here at 4.30. Uh, she's giving a lecture today. So, Brandon Friedman uh, is going to speak today. The title of his talk is Iran, Ideology and Foreign Policy from Khomeini to Khomeini. Uh, Brandon is a research fellow at the Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University, um, a place that uh, Isa has done work on exchange programs with Professor uh, Bashri and others from the Center, so we're proud to continue the uh, connection. Uh, Brandon, uh, his PhD is focused on uh, regional politics of the Persian Gulf during the period of British withdrawal from the region. He did a master's uh, at the Department of Middle East and African History at Tel Aviv University, and he wrote on the roots of the 1920 Iraq Revolt. Uh, Brandon is from the U.S., now residing in Israel. Uh, previously, his before his academic work, he spent eight years in the field of intelligence and investigation in the United States, working on complex fraud and corruption matters, including searching for the hidden, for hidden international financial assets. Uh, over the last two years, he's also worked publishing short bulletins for the Center of Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University regarding the political, the current political developments and issues related to Iran. And of course, Iran has uh, important strategic, uh, geo strategic geopolitical uh, implications uh, these days, and certainly for the work of ISA, um, the regime uh, characters that Brandon will speak about are also not only speaking in terms of demilitarizing Israel and advocating for Israel's destruction, but I think at one level also spreading a narrative that is based on the protocols of the elders of Zion, really spreading a genocidal form of anti-Semitism, which is not just having traction at the political nuclear question at that level, but also at the grassroots that we're seeing the spread of inflammatory and bombastic statements. On, this, on, on the same day, on Quds Day in Lebanon, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, also delivered a speech in which he said, from the first day and from the very beginning, the Imam Khomeini was very frank and said, Israel is a cancerous cell that must no longer exist. President Ahmadinejad is not bringing anything new. President Ahmadinejad is reviving the rhetoric of Imam Khomeini. May God have mercy on his soul. Israel must be annihilated. For anyone who's interested, I can provide you with the uh, BBC's English translations if you'd like to see the full statement. Um, as someone who's an aspiring historian and, and is training in the historical method, I often feel compelled to try to con contextualize these provocative and threatening statements. Um, and today I'm going to try to provide a framework for analysis of the Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, revolutionary ideology and foreign policy record. Um, before I get into the detail, I have four major points that I'd like to introduce today. First, I believe the Islamic Republic of Iran's foreign policy has been and continues to be revolutionary. Uh, but that does not mean pragmatic and ideological behavior are mutually exclusive. I plan to elaborate on that uh, as I get a little bit further on. 
The second point I have is that the broad themes of Iran's revolutionary identity are framed in its discourses of independence, justice, and resistance. And I'll elaborate on these a little bit further. Third, Iran's anti-Israel, anti-Semitic ideology is couched in discourses of justice and resistance. However, these discourses fail to account for, anti for the anti-Semitic um, component of their revolutionary ideology, which has intensified since 2005 and included repeated instances of Holocaust denial. Uh, however, in addition to being an important revolutionary pillar, uh, Iran's anti-Israel ideology has served an instrumental purpose in legitimating and, and provide has a certain instrumental, legitimating, and strategic function in Iran's uh, post-revolutionary domestic and regional politics. Uh, I'll also elaborate on this further. The fourth point that I, I'd like to uh, introduce today is, I do believe the regime has demonstrated in the past 30 years it is capable of compromising or tactically conceding on its, idea, uh, on its ideological um, goals. But these instances have occurred primarily when the regime's leadership has feared the survival of the regime is at stake. Um, and I plan on elaborating that a little bit further, too. Uh, I'd like to begin with the issue I came here to discuss, which is the role of ideology in Iran's post-revolutionary foreign policy. Um, to begin with, I'd, I'd like to raise a question that I've often heard um, over and over again, uh, presented by Western statesmen and diplomats, as well as students, in Europe, Israel, and here in the US. Um, the question is, does Iran act rationally or ideologically? Um, and there are many forms this question takes, and you hear it over and over again. Does Iran act on its interests, or does it act based on religious dogma? Is Iran pragmatic or fanatical? What role does religion play in Iran's foreign policy? Does Iran um, recognize the imperatives of real politique, or are they an ideological regime? I think what I'd like to do, I think my modest goal for today, is deconstruct that often raised question and try to tackle the underlying issues, and perhaps uh, raise the issue of whether that's the right question to be asking. Um, so what exactly do we mean when we talk about Iran's pragmatism? Are we talking about this? Are we all talking about the same thing? Uh, according to the Western uh, liberal canon of political philosophy, John Stuart Mill has described the flexibility behind the pragmatist view of action as it can be experimental because it trusts the grand direction of the underlying pattern of change. I'll repeat that. It can be experimental because it trusts in the grand direction of the underlying pattern of change. In contrast to Western liberal thought, an Iranian scholar based in the Islamic Republic has characterized Islamic Shiite pragmatism of Iran as capable of being experimental because it trusts in the grand direction of its underlying pattern of values. Um, the point here is that the post Khomeini leadership in Iran has derived its pragmatism from what it perceives as a dynamic ideology. And this definition of pragmatism is the conceptual opposite of the Western definition. In other words, Western statesmen and Iranian diplomats and elected officials may be using the same terms, but they're referring to completely different concepts. Scholars in the Islamic Republic argue that the conventional Western assumption of a pragmatic and fundamentalist dichotomy fails to account for pragmatic qualities and ethos of, the, of Islamic fundamentalism and what is considered pragmatic action occurring on the basis of submerged values. Um, that is to say, for Iran, pragmatic behavior can also be value-driven ideological behavior. Pragmatic and ideological behavior are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Ideological goals and material or strategic interests can be pursued in parallel, where one is mutually reinforcing the other, and it is not an either-or, zero-sum proposition. Uh, well, okay, you might be saying to yourself, but so what? Why does this distinction matter? Um, it matters because when West, Western states can perceive Iran's behavior as pragmatic, there may be a temptation to conclude that the Iranian re regime has reoriented itself and, no, and is no longer strictly adhering to its ideological principles. This conclusion is problematic because it pre presupposes 
an earlier phase of behavior which was not necessarily pragmatic and based entirely on ideological reasoning and does not dif 